Good morning. My name is Al Houghton, and this is The Word at Work, and I'm really glad you're with us because we are doing a Bible study, learning how to walk in the Holy Spirit in the last days, and we have discovered some exciting things as we've been led by the Holy Spirit, and we certainly have, and so I believe that's going to continue today because we're transitioning out of the school of the Spirit in the five chapters of John, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And so today I want to look at knowing the Lord, wa walking with him from the position of knowing him. And uh, the amazing part of those chapters in the Gospel of John is very simply that they give us emphasis on relationship like nothing we find anywhere else in scripture. I mean, Jesus really did prepare the 12 to fill his shoes because <laughs> they were where they'd been asking him for three and a half years. And he just said straight out, okay, in the future, you're going to ask me nothing. You're going to ask the father in my name that he may give it you that your joy may be full. So it's the culmination of the promise Jesus made, guys, you're better off if I'm out of here. Because if I'm out of here, that guarantees you a three for one shift. Three. And that, of course, is in, we looked at this so many times, I probably shouldn't even have to mention it, but it is in John 14. And a very familiar verse that everybody knows. In my 14, two, in my father's house are many mansions. Well, I hope to shout. I go to prepare a tapas, a place. Mansions, only used twice, Monet. Um, go to prepare a place, tapas, 90 plus times. And so we go over to verse 23, and the mansion Jesus is talking about is us. And I mean, that's the promise, because Judas says, hey, Lord, how is it you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Well, Jesus' answer is, he answered and said, if anyone loves me, pure and simple, how, how do you demonstrate you're part of my family? You love me by doing what my word says. You love me by doing the word. That, that's how Jesus defined his family. Who is my mother? Who are my sisters? Who is my brother? These who do the word of God. These who do the will of the Lord in heaven. That's my mother, sister, brother. That's my family. Okay, here we have. Same thing again, right here in John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. Now there's a statement. My father will love him. Well, what does that look like? My father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him, our home, we, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, three for one deal. We will come and make our mansion in you. You're the temple. We're going to indwell you. And <laughs> oh, when you go over to John 17, now everybody knows the high priestly prayer in John 17. But how about the last verse? Well, what's the emphasis of the last verse on John 17? Okay, now get this. This is Jesus praying. This is, he's summing up his high priestly prayer where he gives us the glory. And um, here's what he says. And I, this is verse 26, John 17, 26. This is what it says. So often we read the Bible, but we just don't hear the heart behind it. Hear the heart of Jesus behind this whole prayer and these five chapters. <laughs> this is the heart. Remember this? He who believes on me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater because I go to the Father. Peter, you get the deal of the life coming up, buddy. There's three of us, and we're, we're making you our mansion. Wow. 
Uh, here it is, verse 26. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them, last phrase, and I in them. Jesus, what's the last thing on your heart when you're praying about all this? Father, I want to be where they are. <laughs> I want to be in them. We, the Father, the Spirit, we, Jesus himself will come and make our home in you. Our mansion is in you. Woo, listen to that. I mean, I've read that. How many times have I read that? And the last time I read it, I looked at that last phrase and I thought, boy, there's the heart of Jesus on display right there. Before the Father, in prayer, God, there's only one place I want to be. I don't want to be in heaven. I want to be in them. <laughs> oh, I wonder why. Well, I suspect because if he if he takes up residence in here, he's got some plans to pop out. Oh yeah. And and what was that called? That was called tapas. And that was in 14.2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a tapas. And what did we find was tapas 90 plus times in the New Testament? A tapas is an encounter. A tapas is where the Lord comes out of you in a Holy Spirit anointed encounter. It's where you fulfill scripture. And remember, we, we looked in Jesus' own hometown, and there he was, and it went into the temple, and they handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written. And that's in Luke chapter 4. Remember that? His own hometown, Luke 4. Now, that's where the word he had to preach made him so mad, they wanted to throw him off the hill. <laughs> now, now, there you go. Go home and let the Holy Spirit give you a word. And it's so exciting. Everybody there is or wants to kill you practically. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Listen to this. All right. Here it is. Our Bible, Luke chapter 4, verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the tapas, the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach the deliverance of the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now hear this, tapas. This is a tapas. This is what a tapas looks like. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down, the eyes of all who were on him. He began to say to them, here it is. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You just saw a tapas that God prepared before the foundations of the world that I should walk in them. And how many of those are in your life? Tons. Tons. The end time church? Are you kidding me? The, if, if you and I are here in the last days, and we are here, and it's shaping up to be the last days, God has prepared tapas encounters for the church. Not just one or two, many. Hallelujah. And how do you and I access, access those? Well, well, well. Now that does bring us to something interesting. And what does that bring us to? How well do we know the Lord? How well do we know? I mean, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are right here. 
but how well, how much time do we give developing that relationship? How well do we know? <laughs> I, I have to admit, I felt like I knew the Holy Spirit pretty well. I've spent a lifetime trying to train myself to walk in the Spirit. Felt like I got to know Jesus fairly well. But I'll tell you, the one, the one that's just a week or two old, that's, that's the father, showed up and said, hey, tell everybody. You remember that? Yeah, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Tell everybody the season's changed. The book of Revelations, my book, and you're representing me when you hit those places. So get ready. You tell them, get ready. I'm coming to develop a relationship with the church. I'm coming to prepare you for your tapas moments with the father, basically. Now, that's what the Lord told me. And I told you, I mean, as soon as I got it, I didn't wait a, a month. I mean, I got it out as soon as I heard it. I brought it to you. Hallelujah. So we are going to start today right here in Hebrews chapter eight, looking at a very, something very familiar. We're going to start in verse seven, Hebrews eight, verse seven. Here we go. For if that first covenant had, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, not with the covenant, with the people who said yes to it. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now, what does it mean to be disregarded? Well, it means you pray stuff and you have to wait forever or you, you wonder if you're ever going to see any action. I mean, it feels like you're disregarded, all right? So what covenant now is he talking about? And by the way, the reference right here in verse 7 in my Bible, possibly in yours, if you have a study Bible and then close to mine, he gives you Exodus uh, 19.5. Well, what do we find in Exodus 19.5? Okay, that was the covenant. You know, God brought them out to the mountain. And where Moses saw the burning bush, God brought them out to the mountain. And then God said this, Exodus 19.5. So this is the first, the, the earlier covenant, not the Abrahamic covenant. But this is what we call the Mosaic Covenant, the law, the law. So whenever you tend toward the law, you get disregarded by God. Why? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, were they responsible for bringing forth the law? Yes. But the law was to reveal the holiness of God. And it was also to re reveal the fact that you and I couldn't keep it. And we needed a Holy Spirit on board to empower us. We needed a Savior, and we needed the empowering. And that's why Jesus' last words were, Dad, I want to be in them. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> Anytime we tend toward Phariseeism, which is elevating that covenant above everything else. If our relationship is law-based, we stand in a place of probably being disregarded when we pray. We have to move 100% over to relationship. Relationship, 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 where we're following the spirit based on the word. Hallelujah. We're following the spirit and how he leads us through the word. That's the issue. Well, here's 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you should be a special treasure to me above all people, for the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, kings and priests. 
sound familiar? They didn't quite make it. <laughs> it was offered, but they, they never got to fulfill it under that covenant. But who does? We do. That's one of the promises in the new covenant, kings and priests. Hallelujah. Okay, so what I just wanted to go back there long enough to identify what covenant is he talking about? He's talking about the law. Talking about the law. Okay. So, because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant they made with their fathers in a day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, the law. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I hope to shout on board in the house. Next verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, no, the Lord. For all, all, all shall know me. Ginosko. That's the Greek word, okay. Ginosko. And it generally means the ultimate in intimacy. They will all know me intimately, is what the scripture says. Ginosko. And I mean, that, that is quite a word. All right. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying, No, be intimate with God, the Lord. And by the way, Lord, which now this is important. This is important. Because when it comes to the issue of lordship, there are a couple of things that come into view here. And based on Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost, and Peter stands up to preach, this Jesus, God has raised up, verse 32, of which we're all witnesses, therefore being exalted the right hand of the Father, Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, verse 36, let all the house of Israel know, know, know assuredly, oh yeah, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Kurios, judge of all the earth, and Christos, savior of all the earth. No, no Kurios, no Christos. Well, you know Christos because you accept Jesus. So what is the emphasis here? The emphasis here in Hebrews 8 is kurios, no kurios. You shall all be intimately acquainted with kurios. Why? Because he lives right here, and you and I are going to represent him. So there is a bit of a shift as we move toward the, a, a newer emphasis for the season ahead that we haven't quite come into yet, but we're in the process. We're in a process of growing into this season where the judge of all the earth is going to selectively manifest in order to be the Christos of all the earth. So God, what God does in the last days, he selectively manifests judgment in order to save more people. So for you and I to be representatives of the Christos that we know really well, the Holy Spirit, that in healing and deliverance and freedom, and I mean, all the gifts of the Spirit, which we know well, I mean, those of us who've studied and walked with him for decades, I mean, that, that's, that we know the Holy Spirit. We know the voice of the Holy Spirit. We know the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, 
we've got enough mothers and fathers in the faith who came in in the charismatic renewal back in the latter 60s and early 70s. Oh, yeah. What did they cut their teeth on? The Holy Spirit. I mean, when I was a kid, <laughs> the, the move was the Spirit. The restoration was the Spirit. And I've lived long enough now for the emphasis to shift to the, the restoration is the Father. The Father is coming. Woo, father on board. That brings a new level of authority. Well, you know, you know what I'm so happy about? I am so happy about this one fact. <laughs> it's not, I, we don't have to work any of this up because the father, G Jesus moved by the gifts of the spirit. Those nine gifts of the spirit, bought and paid for. Well, the father moves but the nine sonship gifts of the spirit, which we were in the middle of just starting when the Lord rerouted us into this relationship series in John. That culminates in, hey, we're getting to know the Trinity, not just Jesus, not just the Holy Spirit. We're getting to know the Trinity. But now the, the thing that makes this easy for us is when the Father wants to shift us into any other mode than what we're pretty much used to, that's ministering the Savior, he does it by a Holy Spirit push. <laughs> Isn't that rocket science? I mean, it's, it's not having to work up anything. We simply wait for a Holy Spirit push. When you get the Holy Spirit push, man, you're off and running. It's what happened to Jesus in John chapter 2. He got a Holy Spirit push, and he started turning over the changers, uh, tables of the money changers, those who sold those. He started cleaning house. Well, when you get a Holy Spirit push, the Father is manifesting through you to change something out here. It might be to remove somebody. It might be to derail uh, an assault. And you're having the authority to speak to it in Jesus' name. Whoa. When God spoke, the heavens and the earth were created, and he's still a creator. Hallelujah. And there's a creative move that he has saved for us. You know how I know that? Because about 10 years ago, the Lord woke me up at 4.44 a.m. I looked over, I thought, whoa, what's this? And then God said, get up, go upstairs, look up the number four. I said, well, uh-huh, get up, go upstairs. <laughs> you know, 444, sometimes you have to ask for a repeat. <laughs> Would you say that again? It's 444. I'm not used to being up at this time. A little earlier than I get up. So go upstairs and check it out. I thought, oh man, okay. And silence. I mean, you know, hey, now, now it's on you. Go find out what it means. Four is the number for the creator. Repeated three times, it's assured. It's guaranteed. There's an appointed season where the creator is going to come and release creative miracles in the church. Hallelujah. And I said, God, I, I can't go teach that based on numbers. Are you kidding me? There's no way. You're going to have to do something. <laughs> so I had this wood pen. I don't, have, I don't have it with me right now. It's in the drawer. Otherwise, I hold it up for you. Oh, it was handmade, hand-carved wood pen that one of my nephews made for a birthday. And uh, <laughs> so it really became a kind of a favorite pen. It's pretty classy. It, you know, it's a nice wood. and um it just it really does look nice it's distinctive let's put it that way it's different okay so for those of you who like things different this one fits the bill it is very different and so i left that thing and i, I mean i left it at the placerville Inn. i left it on the east coast i mean i have four different places i left that pin and i thought oh no my example and god said 
here's what I want you to do. What did I just tell you? I said, well, you said you're going to do creative miracles. He said, okay, speak to the angel and, and uh, call for either, either go get my pen, bring it back here and put it right here on the dresser or re -re recreate me one exactly like it. your choice. I want my pen back. Four times the Lord had me do that. And four times, I still got it. <laughs> okay. And I can't tell you whether it's a recreation or the original. It's exactly like it. But I can tell you that what God told me to say and what he told me to do. Either recreate one exactly like it or tell the angel to go get it and bring it back and set it right down there. Hallelujah. I know there's creative miracles coming because of that pen. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of crazy stuff God does with prophets. Okay? I was just, you know, if you're a prophet, you know exactly what I mean. God, it was a tapas. How many tapas are in your life out there that you haven't run into yet? Are you kidding me? This is why when you come to a season like this, man, you first thing you do is say, God, here I am. I'm all in. I am all in. I want to develop my relationship with you as a father. I want to see the fullness and I want to walk this out. And I want to, you said nobody would have to teach me for I would know you. I would be intimate with you and with your spirit and with your creative power. Absolutely. Now, Father, I declare that over every person watching me right now in the name of Jesus, that your intimacy with the Father doubles. It starts growing right now. It grows through this series. It grows through everything we're doing here. That's why we're here. We're here to help you grow into this and represent the fullness of the Godhead. Hallelujah. And, and that's the exciting part. I'm telling you, many of you, you're going to walk in that. You're going to hear the voice of God. You're going to speak creative things, and you're going to see God do it. Hallelujah. And how do you prime that pump? Praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit reaches out there and pulls those things in. Now, I'll tell you, this, this word, gen osko, is a really important word in Scripture. Because it's the ultimate in intimacy. And it, it says right here in Hebrews, in the new covenant, God himself is going to show you his intimacy. Jesus is going to supervise it. And the Holy Spirit is going to execute it for both the Father and the Son. You're a walking representation of the Trinity. I'd hope to shout. We, you see what Jesus was getting ready, the 12 for. He was getting the 12 ready to be intimate with God himself. And the promise was, the works that you saw me do, you will do also and greater. Hallelujah. Is anything impossible to the end time church? No, not if God says, go do it. It isn't because he's the one doing it. It's not us. We're just here representing the father. I mean, it's real simple. We're walking with God day in and day out. We're praying in the spirit until we get that Holy Spirit push. Hallelujah. So what is a Holy Spirit push? <laughs> a Holy Spirit push comes out of Romans chapter five. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's a literal Holy Spirit inner push. And in Romans chapter five, we see an example of that. And that's why Romans five is important. And so here's what it says. Romans chapter five. Oh my. Now, five, five. Now, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out. Now, the word poured out in our hearts is the word for the bursting of a wineskin. 
And it's that Holy Spirit push. When the Lord Jesus was pushed into overturning the tables of the money changers, he was pushed. Peter was pushed to speak to Ananias and Sapphira. He was pushed. Paul was pushed to declare blindness on the false prophet. Okay, these things are Holy Spirit pushed. If you develop your intimacy, all you have to know is that the judicial consists of a Holy Spirit push, and you simply follow what God gives you at that moment. And if you be obedient to build, praying in the Spirit into your life as a discipline, you will reach out in the realm of the Spirit and you will pull those top boss moments into manifestation. You'll be equipped and you'll be ready when they come because you prayed it out before you got there. Jesus himself said, look, when you find yourself in front of a council, you know, all of a sudden, they, people are going to hate you in the last days. And I mean, they're going to want to throw you in jail. And you're going to find yourself on display having to give an answer for what you believe. What did he say? Study hard? No, he didn't say study hard. You know what he said? Take no thought for the spirit will give you what you need in that moment. And it will be beyond the ability of any individual to contest the wisdom of God, the glory of God will manifest by God's own spirit in that moment. It's a tapas moment. Take no thought. I mean, surely we remember this. I mean, it's in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus sent out the 12. We've gone through this not once or twice. We've talked about this. Not once or twice. Oh, my. Let's at verse 19. Well, I'll back up and I'll get 18. Now, this is Matthew 10, 18. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Top us moment. You're going to be on display. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father. Oh, father. <laughs> now, you know, Jesus didn't have to say it that way. He could have just said the spirit. But what did he say? He said, the spirit of your father. Ooh, uh oh, what's that mean? That's, that's kurios. That's the judge of all the earth. The spirit of your father. Ooh, did we learn something today? Oh, yeah. See, most of us read that. And I think just the spirit's going to do it. That's not what Jesus said. He said, the spirit of your father. Father is coming out. Father created the heavens and the earth. You don't think Father can judge it? Well, listen, when this comes out of you, nothing is impossible. I'm going to read that again. See, we read the word and we read over stuff. We all do it. I, just, I wouldn't be on this if God didn't highlight this. And he didn't give me this yesterday. This one came right here, right now. While I'm, while I'm talking, this came while I am talking to you right now. This is not in my notes for today. I'm going to have to end. I'm sure <laughs> so far I've gotten through the first line. Now, I prepared a great word today, but it's obvious it was bigger than I am. And the Holy Spirit has come to say, hey, I need to emphasize some things that you don't know, Al. I've, how many times have I read that verse? Hundreds of times. Why do you read through the word every year? Why do you read the word over and over again? Because there's stuff you didn't see that the Holy Spirit highlights, and he promised to show us things to come. 
Well, church, the season has changed. We heard that by the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. God said, you declare it. The season has changed. The Father is coming. You're going to represent the Father. I didn't know this was here. Whoa, it's been there all along. I'm going to read it again, verse 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you, aha, uh -huh, to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Who's he going to show up in that moment? God himself. Father God is going to show up. This is my son. This is my daughter. He's going to show up. He's going to show up in authority. He's going to show up in power. I mean, he could hide you like he did Jesus so nobody can see you. He could translate you. Or you could end up cleaning house in a temple. Or you could do a demonstration and everybody there gets saved. Whoa. It's a top off moment. You don't know what's coming unless the Lord shows you beforehand. But when you develop your relationship, you are ready. You're ready. You're ready because you know the Spirit, you know Jesus, and you know the Father. And when the Spirit of your Father declares something, he will execute it right there. Hallelujah. Woo, man, I'm telling you. Okay, guess what? We, we need to look at Gen Osco. We need to find a few places where Gen Osco appears, okay? Why, why? That's called a comparative word study. Why do you do those? Because it does this just relate to intimacy with the Father, or does it go beyond? It? Is it broader? Oftentimes, it's broader, and so when you find it used in a broader way, you put your faith around all of it. You put your faith around the intimacy part, and you put your faith around the broader part, if it could be beneficial. That's why you do comparative word states. They help you grow. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to Luke 24, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13. Now, this is a familiar passage to many of you because this is on the road to Emmaus. Ooh, wow. Luke 24, verse 13. Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. They talked together about all these things which had happened. So it was. While they conversed and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, he was just resurrected. I mean, this is like resurrection day. He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Verse 18. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said, <laughs> what things? <laughs> oh, my. And they said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. It's resurrection day. <laughs> Jesus is just resurrected. He disappeared to them. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. They did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Woo. All right. How? 
I'm going to go back and pick up verse 16. Now listen to this. Because I read it, but I read over Genosko. Ultimate in intimacy. Verse 16. Their eyes were restrained, so they did not Genosko. Ooh. Did Jesus hide himself one time and walk through the myth when they were trying to kill him? Yes. Hallelujah. Did they lose their grip one time? Yes. Genosko is powerful because God can hide you like he hid Jesus, or he can give you full discernment so you see the Antichrist people that are right in front of you and you see their motivation. So Genosko has a wide application, and we need them both, hallelujah, and we need to know them both. Oh, man. No, 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 no. Genosko, hallelujah. It is really something. Now, it's also in Matthew chapter 7. Oh, yeah, Matthew chapter 7. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, in a very familiar passage, starting in verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear um, bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will, verse 20, genosko. Oh, so genosko is a discernment. It has a discernment section. Yes, it does. It has a Holy Spirit discernment section where God opens your eyes and you discern the Antichrist people or an Antichrist plot or motivations of heart, and it comes by the Spirit. So there's a discernment aspect of this that sets us up so that we know what we're dealing with. And when you know what you're dealing with, you can pray about it much more accurately. Hallelujah. Look at verse 21. Now, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Whoa. Shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Here we are again. We're back to the doing the word, doing the will that marks the family of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never, verse 23, I never, gen osko, ultimate in intimacy. You walked with me, but you did your own thing. You never developed the intimacy I wanted you to have so that you would follow my spirit. Instead, you did your own thing. You built your own kingdom, whatever it is, okay? How important is Gen Osco? It is very, very important. Building a relationship with the Trinity is essential, and God wants this for us. He has this for us. I mean, the He's given us a way to pray it into existence because we, we don't know what we're praying when we're praying in tongues. So we can be praying about things we don't even realize we're praying about. They're authored because he forms the words. They're authored by him. And anybody who's praying in the spirit, you're praying the perfect will of God. That's what we're told in Romans 8. Oh, man. You know that probably one of the most important things we've ever talked about 
is the issue of, and nobody taught me this in seminary. I, I had to let it slip. I had to repent myself for letting tongue slip. Nobody ever told me I needed to build it as discipline into my life, but God. And he sent me to the backside of Australia to learn it. And I've said that many times. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is look at how important is that? Well, it's so important there's a group of people who don't do it who won't be in heaven. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Why? You didn't come in to gen osco. You, you didn't open up to intimacy with God so you could do his will. You stayed away so you could do your own. That's how important this is. I mean, with Jesus' last, nearly last words in a high priestly prayer, Father, I want to be where my people are. I want to be with them. Boy, that shows you the heart of God himself. And so when we talk about having the Trinity in here, all three of them, want and deserve a representation by us. And I've been, look, we found something today. We found that when you're in persecution, when you're under the gun, the reason why you take no thought is the spirit, didn't say the spirit of Jesus, didn't say the Holy Spirit, said, the spirit of your father. Oh, there's the ultimate authority of the universe. The father decides when the rapture will be. Jesus doesn't know. Spirit doesn't know. They're waiting to find out. The father. The father. The father. You and I, if we live long enough, we're going to probably find ourselves representing the spirit of our father. And we, we'll do that. We'll be prepared for that. We'll be ready for that. As long as we've developed this intimacy and praying in the spirit is an awesome way to do that. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What are we emphasizing today? It's real simple. Hebrews 8, that's where we started. You don't have need that anybody teach you. In the new covenant, nobody will come and say, no, the Lord, for God himself will come to you. If you will open up and say, Lord, I'm going to give you some time. I may start out with 10 minutes a day praying in the spirit or as I'm going to do as much as I can do. I'll start out with, I'll at least get to, I'll do my driving time. I'll take my driving time or whatever. Find, find something where it's just sort of rote, you know, you just, and redeem the time you can and give it to praying in the spirit. You're building, 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 building intimacy. You're reaching out. See, you hear the heart of Jesus, the heart of the Father. I want relationship with you. I adopted you. You were chosen, holy, blameless. Now, we've still got those to cover because we, well, this is a series got interrupted relationally by the John, five chapters of John. But we were on chosen. We're going to get back to it. But every once in a while, you got to say, okay, how intimate is my relationship with God? Am I interacting with him daily? Am I, am I, am I hearing his voice? And am I doing as well? I mean, that's really what this is all about. Because you see what the Bible says about it. It's clear. God says, this is on my heart, and I'm coming to you to develop intimacy. So give me some time. 
But that's really the message. Just a whole hour with one. Yeah, that's it. A whole hour with one. Give me some time. I hear God crying out to his people. Give me some time. Give me some time. That's all he wants. He wants a little time so he can manifest his intimacy with you. Hello? That's pretty simple, isn't it? You know, it really is, but look at the fruit. The fruit of it is, whoa, number one, you're going to be there. No, nobody going to toss you out. You will be in heaven on that day. Number two, if you ever get brought up in front of a council or anybody ever puts you under the gun, the spirit of your father, they'll wish to heck they hadn't done it because the spirit of your father is coming out. Now, that is the judge of all the earth. So you just imagine what you're getting ready to say. You won't know till you get there, but I'll tell you what, it'll, it'll bring the fear of God. When you speak by the spirit of your father, the fear of God will manifest. People start shaking in their boots and they're just liable to run the other direction or wish the heck they never called you up in front of their council to start with. If you're one of the witnesses in the last days and they try to kill you, they're the ones that are dead. I mean, you don't know, but you develop intimacy today. You get ready for this today. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about. That's why this is so very, very important. Hallelujah. Gen Osco. Uh-oh. Is there, there a, another word? Yes, there is a, another word. Well, there's epigenosco. <laughs> and, and, and what about that? Well, in Greek, when you add a prefix, then usually you're strengthening the concept. And you are, because epigenosco is thoroughly no. I mean, Know that you know that you know, all right? And, oh my, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But when you get up here to verse 20, therefore by their fruits, you will know them. Oh, oh, oh. You will know them, and it's the double. It's used twice. It's repeated. Gnosko, Gnosko. So when it comes to the issue of discernment for the last days, there is a promise, and it only appears if you look at it in Greek. But in the Greek, it is the double. Hallelujah. So God promises the double in the Greek. Oh my. Is there any other place? Yes, actually, there is. There is another place, and that is over in for a very familiar uh, place. Actually, everybody knows it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and almost everybody knows the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away, for we know in part, prophesy in part, but when that which is mature, perfect, is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face for now, now I epigenosco in part, then epigenosco, epigenosco, epigenosco. Then I shall know just as I am known. Now that last phrase is the double. It's the double. So what, what is this saying? This is saying that we grow as we grow in intimacy with God. You grow into a place probably in your latter years or you in your, I mean, 
Jesus grew into that place in pretty short order. He made it in his 30s. Okay. You grow into a place where the double is operational for you. And that's something that, what does that do? That gives you tremendous peace and it gives you great faith because God's promise is, I want you to have fullness. How many chapters in Ephesians? Ephesians has six chapters. Six chapters of Ephesians. Every single chapter focuses on one truth. In the last days, I'm going to bring you into the fullness of the Lord, the fullness of Christ. Every chapter, six chapters, fullness, 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 fullness. In 1 Corinthians 13, you see the same thing. When in, as we, perfection, maturity, that's the, the uh, issue of maturity. When you grow up, when you put away childish things, when you put away things, you got any things you need to put away that are stealing your time from intimacy with God? Man, put them away. Put them away. Because look what the Lord is promising. He says the double is for those who mature. You will know that you know that you know. You'll walk in the double. And it's discernment. It's the knowledge of God. It's knowing the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit push. It's the Savior. It's the judge. It's the fullness of Christ is available to us. And do you need it right now? Oh, yes, you do. Because if you have it right now, God will have you speaking things that will save this nation, will give us our country back. And the spirit of your father will come out of you in power, in authority, and nobody can gainsay or resist it. Nobody. Woo! That's Ananias and Zavira. That's that's raising the dead. It's making them dead. It's, uh, it's whatever is needed at the time. Hello. And nothing you see happening anywhere should scare you because God himself can recreate it in a heartbeat or remove any of the thieves or, what, or pour out a healing anointing that will eradicate a pandemic in the name of Jesus. That's not a problem for God. It's easy for God. Hallelujah. All things are possible to him who believes. What's the key to this? Ginosko. Epigenosko. Hear the heart? Do you hear the heart? Do you hear the heart of the Father? The heart of the Father is pleading, saying, I want to know you intimately, and I want you to know me intimately. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, everybody who's listened to this word today, double their intimacy in Jesus' name. Let it flow like a river. Hallelujah. So that every day they give themselves to you. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Lord. I bless you for it. Your army is forming in Jesus' name. And you need to take a word out of Matthew chapter 10, the spirit of your father. Woo-hoo-hoo. Hello. Okay, I know who that is. <laughs> That's curious. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both judge of all the earth, kurios, savior of all the earth. Oh yeah, the spirit of your father. Woo, here we go. You talk about the last day is gonna be exciting. Nothing like it. Hallelujah. Well, look, thanks for tuning in. Praise the Lord. Go to wordatwork.org. There's some material there that will help. If there's a one uh, touch download, that'll get you um, nine Bible studies on uh, all the things that tongues do. 
Hallelujah. If you want to study it, I highly recommend it. But you have to go to archives. You have to go to the Word of Work, and you have to go to archives, and uh, you'll find it. One button, one touch to download. And if you get a chance, so something in the ministry. God will bless you for that. And we will see you next week. Same time, same station, right here. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks for being who you were ordained to be in the last days. In Jesus' name, bless you.